my pleasure to participate in this wonderful meeting in honor of Jean-Marc. And um, so this is going to be a proof. Um, and um, I want to emphasize that it's uh, joint work with Hui Nguyen, who's now in the University of Maryland. <coughs> Uh, and I thought I'd, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but Euler himself wrote, this is a translation, maybe from Latin. Uh, I just read a bit of it. If it is not permitted uh, to us to penetrate a complete knowledge concerning the motion of fluid, I'll skip it, up. it is analysis itself which abandons us here. Since all the theory of emotion of fluids has been reduced to the solution of analytic formulas. <laughs> I think analytic formulas means PDEs. And I think that it's a good uh, theme for the for this whole meeting. <laughs> okay, now I'm going to uh, show you. I thought I'd show a couple of water waves. <laughs> a little more complicated than the ones we usually study. There we go. Regular and give a nice two dimensional wave. Okay. So, um, <laughs> so I think before the 1960s, it, I believe it was gen generally believed that um, Stokes waves are unstable. Uh, even, e even the small. Uh, uh, yeah, but that the small Stokes waves were stable. I think that was generally believed before about 1965. I, someone can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but then uh, I was told that Benjamin asked his student, or maybe postdoc Fear, to do an experiment on a wave tank, and and they couldn't they they couldn't make it stable. And then that led to this famous paper that the two of them wrote, um, uh, which, which actually showed that uh, even the small waves are unstable if you put in the sidebands. Um, so, um, now I think I don't have to say too much about that because we've already heard several talks about things like that. Uh, but today, in this talk, I will assume just an ideal fluid. So I'm just writing it down with a with a free surface. So it's going to be two D. Uh, it's going to be zero vorticity, as distinguished from this morning, um, and 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 no surface tension. And I'll assume there is gravity. Okay. So very classical. All right. Picture of it. And I, I will take deep water to its infinite depth. And so I think we've already heard a lot of talks. So I just writing down for the sake of, um, of fixing notation, phi is the velocity potential. And everything else I think is straightforward here. That's the infinite depth. And I have gravity. And now. Um, let's see, so a Stokes wave, uh, of course, we know that Stokes, uh, who did a lot of, a lot of things in particular, wrote down an expansion for the waves of small amplitude, traveling waves of small amplitude, and, but they weren't actually proven to exist rigorously mathematically until about 1920. By independently by Nekrasov and Levi Civita. Um, okay, so we're going to start with the Stokes wave and perturb it, a small one. Uh, I mean, the Stokes waves are not small as we heard in previous lectures. <clears throat> okay, so modulational instability. The the so modulational instability is 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 when you put in the sidebands. So the import, in terms of proofs, the first, uh, the first thing that was really a complete proof, it took till 1995 by Bridges and Milka 
to write down a complete rigorous proof of linearized instability. Uh, and they use spatial dynamics. And personally, I find that's a difficult paper to read. Uh, and and I, I find it a little bit abstruse. Anyway, but that was a very important thing that they give a proper proof. Um, so what, what I'm talking about today is taking, is finding another proof. It's quite different from theirs. And, and it doesn't use spatial dynamics. And the bridges milka proof only is valid if you have finite depth. They needed finite depth. Uh, by the way, I'm talking about periodic waves. Okay. Um, so you have a, a finite, a bounded domain. That's why they needed, uh, why they could use spatial dynamics. But it didn't work for infinite depth. It, do, it cannot work for infinite depth. So that's why uh, we and I uh, looked at this problem. And, and we looked at it from a different viewpoint. And so here, here's the theorem. So, so um, mu is the change, is the perturbation in the wave number. So you, you have e to the i mu x. And um, and then there's a linear, we linearize. So I'll say in a moment what I mean by the linearized operator exactly, but the linearized operator depends on two, two parameters, the small amplitude epsilon and, and the small perturbation in wave number mu. <clears throat> and um, um, And so, and then you look for, and then the linearized operator, you look for growth e to the lambda t, where the real part of lambda is positive. And this is what we find in an expansion. So first, this is imaginary. There's no growth. But here's the exponential growth. That's the important term. And these terms, a term like this in my notation here, is just less than or equal to an absolute constant times mu squared, period. And this is an absolute constant times mu epsilon squared, period. All the, all the high order is all included in there. So that's why it's really rigorous. OK. <clears throat> uh, OK, so that's the theorem. And, and so there's really nice numerics from about I know 12 years ago by Katie Oliveras, who's here, and Taconic, uh, which this is numerical, which illustrate this is the complex plane, which is the figure eight. We've seen that before. Uh, this is the figure eight in the complex plane, and this is for a fixed, small, relatively small amplitude epsilon, and this is the curve as a function of mu. And uh, so the theorem that I just had in the previous slide is just talking about near the origin. So that those numbers are, there's some point right there. Uh, let's see, in the, in the first quadrant. Uh, okay, so, but this gives more detail about that eigenvalue. Um, and now after we finish our paper and, uh, Three different groups of people also announced sort of different proofs or additional things about the same kind, the same problem rather shortly after we did it. Uh, so uh, in particular, Vera and Zhao Yang and also Chen and Su, but in particular, Berti and his group in um, Sisa in Italy, Berti Maspero Ventura, uh, went further in the analysis and did a more detailed and rather, rather brilliant analysis where they actually get the whole figure eight curve. Now, I won't talk about that. I just mentioned that, that that's an uh, important result. 
Um, and what I want to what I want to do here is is talk about our proof uh, of of the, of the instability. And I think I can we know that there are many approximate models. This is not an approximate approximate model. It's the full the full water wave system. Uh, okay, so I'm going to. So the rest of this talk is about a proof of that theorem. I'll try not to be too overly technical. Um, so uh, there are really two parts. Uh, certain trans changes of variables would bring it to a to a form where it's more accessible, and then and then it reduces more or less to a four dimensional problem with a very complicated. That linear operator is, reduces to four dimensions, that reduction, and then the analysis of that four dimensional problem. So what I list you with the three bullets is uh, we're gonna linearize, we're gonna do some transform to a to a to a half to a half plane. The fluid domain will become a half plane with a flat top. And and the third thing is introduce the the, way, the perturbations. So so we start we're starting from the Zakharov Gregson formulation, which is which is I think well known to. Uh, so um, that's our starting point. One could perhaps use a different starting point, but this this works. Uh, so you have a harmonic function, and that, that's that's what I had in the previous slide at the top. That's the standard water wave problem, with gravity, and um, and then phi is the uh, uh, velocity potential, and here I'm I'm using psi for the restriction of it to the surface. That's the Zakharov point of view. And then the system takes this form. And the advantage is you just have the surface given by eta and, and the velocity potential on the surface given by psi. And so you just have these two equations just on the surface, but it's non-local. So the way one writes it is in terms of a so-called Dirichlet Neumann operator, which occurs here and here. Uh, the Duration Norman operator is simply uh, you you just you have your fluid domain and it just goes from Dirichlet conditions to Neumann Neumann data on the top surface. So the unfortunately that's a non-local operator, but it has to be. <clears throat> okay. So we're going to perturb from a Stokes wave. So this is standard there. There's a whole curve of Stokes waves, but we're just going to go to a small Stokes, Stokes wave here. And Stokes himself had expansion, had this expansion. Of, it was a little formal here, assuming in a, a power series, but this is literally correct. So it's kind of amazing where we can quote Stokes from 170 years ago, approximately. Uh, and okay, so we start from Stokes' way. Uh, then the second thing we do is linearize. So it's a little tricky to linearize the um, Dirichlet Neumann operator. So we use, so Lan has a very, Lan has a very nice, uh, formula for how you differentiate with respect to the surface. Um, and, um, and then we change, do a little change of variables here. And so we end up with this guy. Um, so now we have two equations. We had two equations before, but now we have two equations. Uh, it takes a different form. So let me go to the next step we're still changing variables the next step we want to change variables so that the fluid domain becomes just the half plane 
blue domain goes down to minus infinity. And now you just map it to the half plane. And that's just the, the um, uh, uh, Riemann mapping theorem. It's literally the Riemann mapping theorem. So if we do that change of variables, and I won't, get, I'll skip the notation. Uh, you, you get new variables, W1, W2, but now they're on a, exactly a half plane. <laughs> and then it takes this form. These coefficients, the two coefficients here, p star of x, m star of x, they, they're, in, they're constructed from the Stokes wave. Uh, so they involve the Stokes wave. Um, I'm using stars to indicate the Stokes wave. And, um, and we know, and when we use Stokes' expansions, you find that p star looks like this. And M star looks like that. And again, this is just constant, less than a constant times epsilon squared. <clears throat> yes, turns out the same, same beginning of the, of the expansion. Um, okay, so it takes that form for W1, W2. So it's two equations, two PDEs. Ah, and this is this is uh, what the Dirichlet normal property became. This is the the Hilbert transform times the derivative. Um, let's see. So then the final thing is we look for growth in time, e to the lambda t, and we look for a change in wave number, e to the i omega x, e, e to the i mu x. And then I call the new guys. So that's the takes care of the time behavior. And the new guys I'll call uj. Then I'll have an equation for u1 and u2. And u1 and u2 are, I take period two pi. And then uh, we put that in, you get two equations. So you have a, so I'm writing as a two by two matrix here. So yeah, capital U here is the pair u1, u2. And then you then, this was the time derivative, and here's the two equations written down uh, with these two coefficients, p star, m star, and the mu's are in here. So L, by what I call the linearized operator, it's this matrix, this two by two operator matrix. matrix. And so here you have, a, this is an operator, and this is just multiplication, this is a pseudo differential operator. And yeah, the rest is straightforward. And this is mapping from a Sobolev space, H1, periodic. Capital T means period two pi, L2. <clears throat> okay. And all we have to do, there's nothing to do except to show that this matrix has an eigenvalue with positive real part. That's the whole thing. So maybe I'll pause if there's any question. Okay. So let's, let me give you an outline of how one goes about this. The important, important thing we'll use is that the P star and the M star have those expansions that I mentioned before. With error, the error terms are controlled. So here's, I'm just repeating the main theorem. So this is the same as what I wrote before. Uh, you're gonna have a part that's a purely imaginary, and then you're gonna, and it's a double, it's gonna be a, a double eigenvalue on the imaginary axis and it'll split uh, just like we thought in one of the previous lectures. And then this is in the right half plane, the way I've written it, I've taken one of them, and that's, that's the instability here. And then you have the controlled error terms. So in order to do that, now we have to, we have this two by two matrix, uh, two by two matrix of operators, and we have to find it's an eigen, an eigen, we don't want to see all the eigenvalues which are much more complicated, but just the ones 
when epsilon is small and mu is small and near 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 lambda equals zero, near the origin in the complex plane. <clears throat> so first, first the easy thing, if you recall again, uh, that matrix is the matrix. Uh, the easy thing is when you don't have any variable coefficients and then you can Fourier transform. Uh, then you can Fourier transform. Uh, so take, take epsilon equals zero and you only have constant coefficients. So then the, the matrix is just the thing on top. And then you can Fourier transform and so we get the dispersion relation. And okay, but even more extreme, just take no perturbation at all and then zero, lambda equals zero is an eigenvalue of multiplicity four, uh, as is well known. And uh, or, yeah, that's right. Now, now we take, we change mu and we get eigenvalues all on the imaginary axis. They're, 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 um, they're two above and two below the origin. They're all imaginary, and it's just this formula that you see with k equals zero, one, or minus one, and plus or minus, depending on this guy. So, so that's easy, <clears throat> but we got to we got to take some amplitude. So now epsilon will be bigger than zero. I'm taking epsilon and mu positive. <clears throat> so first. First, we, we realize we need to do this. We take mu equals zero now, but we take, this is a preliminary for the other, we need to use this. We take the amplitude non-zero, but, but um, mu equals zero. But then uh, we can prove, this isn't so straightforward, we can prove that there's uh, zero is still an eigenvalue an eigenvalue of multiplicity four. But, um, but in fact, so one of the, this is the, uh, the pair zero one, this is, here's the pair of this, this, so on, these four guys. So uh, the upshot is that, um, that two of them, two of them are actual eigenvalues eigenvectors, um, this is an eigenvector, and I think that's an eigen, yeah, the first two eigenvectors. This is an eigenvector, this is an eigenvector, but these are generalized eigenvectors. So they, U3 and U4, as we see in equation 13, are generalized, in other words, the linear operator on U3 is one of the other guys, yeah, okay. And, okay, we, we need to use these. This is U1, the simplest one, and the other three have these expansions. These, these expansions come right out from Stokes' expansion. You've got to do some calculations. <clears throat> and also it's important and odd, we need to use that kind of information later on. Okay. So when mu equals zero is a four dimensional space sitting right there at the origin. And now we turn on the epsilon and what happens to those four guys? That's what we're, that's what we're trying to do now. Oh, well, it's not so simple. So I'm going to note by script to you uh, the four the four dimensional space that I just showed you, those four guys from the previous slide, I call that script U. And I'm gonna consider the perpendicular, the, the things orthogonal to that. And, and so the, the, we, we're using what's called in dynamical systems, the Lyapunov-Schmidt method. Um, so we, go, we have this equation, uh, over here, uh, the equation LU equals lambda U. 
and we're going to split it into into this. So pi is just the projection onto the infinite dimensional perpendicular space. Everything but the four those four eigenvalues, and this uh, this is the projection onto the four eigen the four dimensional space. So when when you do that. We look. We look for a solution u of the of the problem we want as a linear combination of those previous guys from the previous slide plus what I call the infinite dimensional part. So w here, and then w has to have this form. So we're looking for u with this some alpha alpha j coefficients to be determined uh, acting on uj plus the wj here. And, and okay, we look for u like that. And, and then you have two equations here. This is the infinite dimensional one. This is the four dimensional one. So the, the, if we knew what the, yeah, the, these, this is the one from the previous slide. The WJs, that's this guy here. This first equation is the equation, think of W as a function of the U's. J runs from one to four. One, two, three, four. Four W's are a function of the four U's, but this isn't the what I call the infinite dimensional equation, which we have to somehow deal with. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, so there's the L, I repeated it from before, and we got to do some decomposition. Okay, so let me go faster here. Uh, we can write the point when you do some analysis, we can write a, a, a Neumann, I think it's called a Neumann series, the powers of an inverse uh, and infinite series here. Um, uh, we can we can write the infinite dimensional part in terms of the of the four guys of the four dimensional thing. Uh, it's a, okay. I could give more detail, but I don't want to take too much time on that. But it reduces eventually reduces. So then the WJs are like a complicated depend in a complicated way on the UJs, but think of the WJs as function to the UJs here. And then you get this, the, the four dimensional equation. This is just four dimensional equation with four unknowns, alpha one, the, just scalars, alpha one, two, three, four. And we want to solve for that. So we think of that as just a four by four matrix. And we want to know whether there's we want to find the eigenvalues, so we take the determinant. Uh, so it takes, so it takes its form. Here's the lambda identity, four by four. Uh, yeah, and so so we this is a four by four determinant, and and normally in Lyapunov Schmidt, you this is easy to handle. Um, okay. So, so you got the part four by easy, the easy part, and what, oh yeah, so you got this main part, and then you got what might be the easy part. <clears throat> anyway, so it takes, it looks like this. And we have to find the eigenvalues of this four by four matrix where the entries of this complicated thing. <clears throat> um, so the A, so we just expand everything in powers, we had to figure out what powers, like this is mu epsilon, but we, you see, we don't have certain power, certain combinations we have and certain combinations we don't have. The question is, which are the important terms? Anyway, so if you if you ignore the, the more, that part, which I call B, then, and you look at the determinant, here it is. So you set this equal to zero, and you look for lambda. Well, these are all what I would call error terms. It turned out we had to figure out what was an error term and what wasn't. 
But here, if we solve for lambda, it's, a, it's imaginary. No growth. We have to go to the, to the more complicated part, uh, which I call B, which involved the infinite dimensional piece. And then, so after a relatively long, so we have to expand, including all those other terms. It's a relatively long calculation. We end up with, with this when we include everything. We set this equal to zero. Now, error term, error term. Uh, these R1, R2 are constants. And, and here it looks like lambda equals imaginary, but look at this guy. This is the one that does it for us. There's a term in there. <laughs> okay. And then, so do, am I running out of time? No, no. You still have mm -hmm. several minutes. Oh, you have a few minutes. Yeah. Oh, okay, fine. Okay. Um, so, so, yeah, so that's what it looks like. And that, and then, oh yeah, we, okay. So when we get to this point, we've done a lot of calculations of individual terms, but um, uh, notice that this is, if we look at the pair, lambda mu, it's cubic. Cause this is, this is quadratic times a mu, that's cubic, that's cubic, that's cubic. And then we have what really turns out to be error terms. So we can do a little scaling and take out. So when we, we do that scaling, so uh, we, instead of lambda, we write mu times some other parameter, which I call gamma here. And then you're looking for gamma to have, um, to have a, a positive real part. And, um, and so it looks like that's so a simpler. Here's, here's, I wrote in red here. That's the key term right there. Um, and, um, okay, and then, okay. So then basically, basically use the implicit function theorem. Implicit function is exact. Uh, um, it's a standard, in, at, at some point it becomes a standard implicit function theorem. So then you, Okay, well, let me go on. So final result, when we use the implicit function theorem, then, then that, that, that term that was in red, the one eighth, that's the term that, gi that gives you this, this term here. And that is the instability that you see. It, it, it uh, uh, bifurcated off the imaginary axis, plus or minus actually. These, the, this is the, the G1 and G2 are functions of epsilon or mu, but they're, they're bounded. For, for a small epsilon and mu, they're bounded by an absolute constant. So these are error terms. Here's the important term. And this is where you bifurcate from. And so that's an outline of the proof. Uh, maybe I'll, uh, since I have a minute or two, I thought I would say a few words about this, this uh, work of Berti, Maspero, and Ventura. They did not only, by the way, I just showed you the infinite depth, but the proof that I, everything I showed you also works for finite depth with much more calculations with all those hyperbolic tangents. But uh, we didn't actually write that up as a paper, but these three guys, with their somewhat improved method in some ways uh, can do, they have a paper with finite depth and a paper with infinite depth, both in different papers. Uh, but they, the two main things that, that Berti and his co-authors did, one was they choose the perturbed basis in a more, in a more clever way using the Cato uh, perturbation theory. Cato Jose Ocato wrote this book, uh, Perturbation Theory of Linear, Linear Operators, back about 50 years ago. And so they used that idea. That's a substitute for what I called U1, U2, U3, U4. Um, 
and the other and once they did that they were they were able to partially diagonalize uh it's not it also had a lot of calculations to do this but they partially diagonalized it of these this is a four by four matrix it's the same operator we talked about four by four matrix in tns or two by two matrices okay and that's the main the main way that they um that they they um decompose things in, in a more in a way that they could get that figure eight which which was um uh deconic and oliveras which i showed you that numerical result at the beginning and so maybe that's a good place to and there are a lot of open questions as to proving instability in other situations, but okay, I'll just stick with it.